This is Harsh Rules, I'm Ben Harsh, and today we're going to learn to play One Small Step. One Small Step was released in 2020 by Academy Games and designed by James Dumond, Gunter Eichert, and James Schoek. This game supports up to four players and takes from one to two hours to play. One Small Step is a worker placement game set during the 1960s space race to the moon between the United States and the Soviet Union. Up to four players, two per team, assume the role of these nations' space agencies to conduct satellite missions, build a bank of resources through experiments, and eventually undertake crewed missions to reach the moon. Each space agency is comprised of two departments engineers, and administrators. In four-player games, each player acts as the head of a department by placing their workers on distinct resource spaces on the Earth and limited time worker events on the game board, players must generate critical resources needed to fund their agency space missions. Be aware though, the clock is ticking. Players must scramble to collect the needed resources while scheduled missions escalate through the countdown queue towards launch. Meanwhile, their opponents compete with them for key positions on the board. And often, only one worker may occupy a resource space at a time. If a critical space is occupied, the team must find an alternative source for their mission requirements before launch or the mission fails. Success is often rewarded with victory points for players that can stay ahead in the space race and reach significant milestones on the moon path before their opponent. The first agency that reaches the moon receives a significant prize, but the player with the most victory points on the track wins the game. Thematically, One Small Step contains several famous historical figures from both sides of the space race, as well as numerous scientific experiments, achievements, and spacecraft from the era, making this an educational as well as an entertaining experience for all players. So, if all of this sounds interesting, then stick around because we're going to learn how to play One Small Step. One Small Step, the base game, can be played in two ways a streamlined version for beginning players, and the full version with additional challenges for veteran players. Let's walk through each step of setup, and I'll point out differences between the two versions as we go along. Let's get started with step one and place the game board. For new players, place the beginner overlay on top of the earth. This version is simplified to show only the main action spaces. Once players are familiar with the game and looking for a greater challenge, they can play without the overlay that gives them even more options. In step two, place the crew markers in a pile beside the game board. When a player successfully completes a crewed mission, these markers are used to track progress on the moon path. In step three, separately shuffle the brown satellite bonus tiles and the blue media bonus tiles. Then place them face down in stacks on their symbols at the top of the game board. For step four, place the seven victory point crew bonus tile on the last space of the moon path. Shuffle the rest of the crew bonus tiles and place one face down on each of the five remaining moon path spaces. Stack the four tiles that are left next to the game board. Next, in step 5, shuffle the event cards into three separate era decks based on the era number shown on the back of the cards. Then stack all three decks sequentially with era 1 on the top, then era 2, and era 3 on the bottom. Place the era card deck on its matching space at the top of the game board. Then draw four cards and place them on the four card draft spaces at the bottom of the game board. After that, shuffle the hazard deck and place it on its space on the game board. Only complete step 7 for the veteran version of the game. Shuffle the advancement cards into a deck and place them on the matching space on the game board. Then, 
Draw four cards from the deck and place them face up on the four advancement spaces. Also place the advancement tokens next to the game board. Step 8 is in two parts. For part 1, locate the four starting satellite mission cards. These cards have a key symbol on their card back. Set these four cards aside for the moment. We'll revisit them in just a moment. For the second part of this step, shuffle the remainder of the satellite mission cards into a deck and place that deck on its matching space at the top of the game board. Step 9 has several parts. First, players need to choose which nation they would like to play, red for the USSR or blue for the USA. They will then take that nation's agency board and place it in their personal play space. Next, players will collect their agency's respective workers. There are two types, engineers and administrators. In a four-player game, each side has two players that assume the role of either the engineer department or the administration department. With a two-player game, each player controls both departments. All of these workers are placed in their space on the right side of the agency board. After that, each side will collect their crew mission cards. Crew mission cards have a nation's emblem on the card back to help you tell them apart. Each side will shuffle their deck and place it beside their agency board. Next, each player places a colored cube representing their VP marker on the first space of the VP track. The remaining two colored cubes are used to set up the media track at the top of the game board. The media track represents the public's and the government's support for the space agencies. The player who is ahead on the track has the initiative. The blue US cube starts the game on Space Zero. The USSR begins on Space One because they've launched Sputnik. We'll discuss the media track more once we've set up the game. Next, let's bring out those starting satellite mission cards. Randomly give two out of the four cards to each side. Then they randomly place them on the T1 and T2 spaces below their agency board. Finally, in step 10, players will place the resource tokens in separate supply piles near the board. One pile for round temporary resource tokens, and one pile for square permanent resource tokens. Place the three resource dice next to these. Then each player will select two agency resources to start the game. In a four-player game, each player chooses one resource for their team. And with that, the game is set up and we're ready to begin learning how to play. As stated earlier in the tutorial, the media track is primarily used to determine which side has initiative. When the game begins, the US blue cube is on the zero space and the USSR red cube is on the one space because they've just launched Sputnik. Therefore, since the Soviet Union has the lead on the media track, they have the initiative and can go first until the end of the game round. As the game progresses, players gain media points that increase their cube on this track. Once a cube advances to the fifth space or beyond, that player has the option to spend five of their media points to gain a media bonus tile. Please note though that you cannot spin to less than zero. However, if a player allows their cube to advance to the 8th space, any additional media points earned will cause them to automatically spend 5 points and gain a media bonus tile. The cube will then continue to advance again on the track towards space 8. Media bonus tiles represent the public and the government's support of a space agency. Media bonus tiles usually provide agency resources and a special ability when they are used. A media bonus tile can be played at any time during a team's turn, or when the media bonus dictates. Therefore, until the media tile is used, it is placed face up next to the player's agency board. And then, once they're used, place them face down in the team's discard pile. One final note regarding the media track and initiative. There are several instances where cubes will occupy the same space. 
When a team moves their cube into a space containing the other team's cube, the moving team's cube is placed on top and they receive the initiative. Also be aware that there are media bonus tiles that can be used to flip the order of the cubes and change initiative. Keep these rules in mind when establishing initiative in the game. A game round of one small step is comprised of seven phases which makes up the sequence of play. For your reference, this sequence of play can be found in the center of a player's agency board. Next, we're going to walk through each of these seven phases in greater detail. Mission cards represent experiments or ventures that are either categorized as unmanned satellite missions or manned crewed missions. At the bottom of each agency board is a launch queue made up of three stages, T-2, T-1, and launch. Later in the sequence of play, when players draw mission cards, they will immediately place them on either the T-2 or T-1 stage. There is no limit to the number of missions that can be placed in either of these stages. When placing a mission on the T-2 stage, a player may immediately roll the red satellite die and gain the resulting resources. This is shown by the red die symbol next to the T-2 title. The objective of this phase is to advance mission cards across the path and queue up the next missions for launch. Therefore, to complete this phase, move each mission on the agency board one stage to the right in the following order. T-1 missions move to the launch stage, and then T-2 missions move to the T-1 stage. One small step has nine different resources in the game that are organized into three different groups. There are agency resources, satellite resources, and crew resources. Resources are represented by two types of tokens. Round tokens are temporary resources. When round temporary resources are used, they are discarded back into supply. Square tokens are permanent resources. These remain on a team's agency board. When they're spent, they're flipped from their black fresh side to their gray spent side. Then, during the replenish phase, any of these spent permanent tokens are flipped back to their fresh side. Each of these resources has a corresponding resource die. This game uses a series of symbols to tell you the number and type of resources you receive for rolling a specific die. The game also provides several opportunities to upgrade temporary resources into permanent ones. Just keep in mind, you cannot upgrade a temporary resource in the same phase in which you earned it. Now that we understand a little more about resources, let's discuss the steps necessary to complete this phase. Completing phase two is conducted in two steps. First, players will replenish the event cards. During the first round of play, this is not necessary, as we've already placed cards on the draft spaces during setup. In subsequent turns, though, these spaces will be emptied out. Then, for the second step, players will refresh their permanent resources. Any square resources that were used in the previous round are then flipped from their gray spent side to their black fresh side. Once again, this will not be necessary in the first round of play. In Phase 3, players draw cards. Card draws are staged by department. Remember, in a four-player game, each player assumes the role of that space agency's department head. In a two-player game, one player heads up both departments for their space agency. Players must decide which department should go first. If there is a disagreement, the side with initiative has final say. Therefore, the engineers can go first or the administrators. For this example, let's say the engineers go first. The engineer department for each space agency draws one card from any of three types. 
and when a department draws their card, both players do so simultaneously. They can select a satellite mission card, or a crewed mission card from their own deck, or an event card. An engineer's ability to select event cards is one thing that differentiates them from administrators. Once one department has completed their card draw, then the other department conducts their card draw in the same fashion. Teams may review the first card drawn before the next department draws their card. The next step depends on the type of cards that are drawn. Brown mission cards are placed below the agency board on either the T-2 space or the T-1 space. For each card placed in the T-2 space, roll the red satellite die and collect the resource as a temporary token. Any green event cards that are drawn are placed depending on their type. Let's take a closer look at event cards to see how this works. Event cards are events, experiments, technologies, buildings, and people that a space agency can utilize in the game. Event cards come in two types. Development cards have a green front and a telescope symbol in the top left corner. Personnel cards have a blue front and an astronaut helmet in the corner. Once drawn, these cards are placed based on their type. Development cards are held in a player's hand. In a four-player game, both players share this hand of cards. There is also no limit to the number of development cards that may be held. Personnel cards are placed on the right side of the agency board next to the personnel symbol. However, there is a limit of three personnel cards that can be placed next to the agency board. When a fourth personnel card is drawn, the player will need to decide which three to keep. The card that is not chosen is placed in that side's discard pile. Before we move on to the next phase, let's discuss the event card layout for both types. Beneath an event card symbol is the era number. This shows which of the three eras a particular card belongs to. At the bottom of the card are two rows. The top row is the card's action. A development event card's action can only be used if it's in the player's hand. If the development cost is met, shown on the right side of the card, then the player receives the result in that row. The personnel event card's action row works in a similar fashion. However, the personnel action can only be used if the card is next to the player's agency board. If the personnel cost is met in resources, then the player receives the result shown in that row. An event card's bottom row is a worker space. This row can only be used if the event card is on a draft space of the game board. In this position, players can place workers to receive the result of that row. Now that we know a little bit more about event cards, let's move on to the next phase. In Phase 4, it's time to place workers. Each space agency alternates taking turns placing a worker until all workers have been placed. During a space agency's turn, the players must decide which department will place one of their workers. Workers are removed from that agency's board and can be placed on either the Earth space or one of the four cards shown on the main board. When a worker is placed, the player completes the action shown on their space. Then, when all workers have been placed, players will retrieve them and place them back on the agency board. Workers that have been placed on cards also receive the card they were placed on. Cards that did not have a worker placed on them are shuffled and placed face down on the bottom of the event deck at the end of the phase. Next, let's take a closer look at the Earth spaces. The beginner overlay simplifies Earth spaces by remixing the actions available and removes the upgrade options used in the veteran version of the game. There are six Earth spaces on the board where a worker can be placed. Most Earth spaces are divided into two sections, the top section for engineers and the bottom section for administrators. In most cases, only one worker can be placed per Earth space. 
For example, if the USSR places a red engineer on the top section, no other engineers can be placed in that space. And this also blocks any administrator from being placed on the bottom section of the space. The inverse is true of placing an administrator on the bottom section of a space. This blocks any additional administrators and any engineers from being placed on the top section. An exception to these rules is the sixth earth space. On this space, any number and type of workers can be placed. Each worker's section on an earth space contains an action to resolve in symbols. One small step provides a summary sheet that defines the actions for each section. Let's walk through some common symbology though to give you an idea of how this works. Small green arrows mean to draw something. Typically, this is a resource. The red arrow with the black background means a player must spend something. This is often a resource or a card. The hand and card icon indicates that a player needs to place a card. The card graphic usually tells you which type. The colored cube and black arrow means a player needs to roll a die. The color indicates which one. Symbols are often linked with either a colon or a slash. The colon indicates an AND statement. For example, spend a card AND receive a resource. The slash is a statement that allows a choice. For example, you may roll a gray die and receive both resources shown, or roll a red die and receive one resource shown. That's just a few of the most commonly used symbols. For a complete definition of every symbol in the game, refer to the back cover of the game's rulebook. In this phase, teams take turn using one of their personnel cards beside their agency board. Remember, each team can have a maximum of three of these cards. A personnel card can only be used once per round. However, there is no requirement to use personnel cards during this phase. Therefore, when it's their turn during this phase, they have the option to pass to the other team. When a player pays the personnel cost on the top row of the card, they gain that row's action, which is immediately carried out. Continue this process until all cards have been used or both players have passed. In Phase 6, each department may choose any development card to play from their hand. This means that a total of two cards can be played from a team's hand during this phase. Once the development cost is paid on the card, that agency receives the associated development action. These actions are then carried out immediately. Once the action is resolved, the card is placed in that team's discard pile. During the launch mission phase, teams alternate taking turns launching one mission from their agency board until all missions at this stage have been launched. A player may launch their missions in any order. When launching a mission, each player performs the following steps. First, they attempt to achieve the mission's minor success by paying the required resources. If this is accomplished, then the player may attempt a major success. However, if a player fails to achieve the minor success, any resources applied to that mission are not spent, but the player must then pay the failure penalty. Early missions may not have a penalty. However, many advanced missions will. If a player cannot pay all the resources, they pay whatever they can to meet the penalty. Once a minor success is achieved, the player may then attempt a major success. Once again, if the player can pay the required resources, they achieve the mission. There are no penalties for failing to achieve a major success. Finally, players will collect rewards from any minor or major successes they've accomplished. Then it's time to clean up the cards in the launch space. If the overall mission did not fail, discard it into your team discard area. If the mission failed, place the card in the game discard area. Now, let's talk about hazard cards. 
Hazard cards add unknown risk to a mission and make it more difficult for the player. When a player gains a hazard card, they have a choice of how to play them. A player can place them unseen onto their own mission for an additional challenge, or they can look at the card and then place it on one of their opponent's mission cards. These cards add resource costs to a player's mission. They can add an additional satellite resource cost to satellite missions, or on a crew mission, they can add satellite resource or crew resource costs. However, if a player overcomes the hazard and achieves at least a minor success, they typically receive a victory point for their effort. Therefore, players need to strategize how best to use these cards. Use them to sabotage an opponent or take an additional challenge for yourself for the potential victory point. There are also a few special hazard cards that have unique effects on a mission. I'll keep these secret as not to spoil them for players, but you may need the symbols on the back of the rulebook to interpret the impact. Besides the rewards shown on mission cards for minor and major successes, players may also receive success tiles. Let's look at each type of mission to see how this works. A satellite bonus tile is awarded for every successful satellite mission. A quick note. Some worker actions also reward satellite bonus tiles. In either event, draw one satellite tile from the stack at the top of the game board and resolve its effect immediately. Then place the used tile face down into the team's discard pile. Satellite bonus tiles represent the knowledge a team's agency gains from a successful mission. They typically award crew resources. Crew mission tiles can be a little more challenging to earn. After completing a crew mission with at least a minor success, that agency places a crew marker on the moon path to record their progress. If that agency is the first to place their marker, they claim the crew bonus tile. Once the bonus tile has been claimed, the next agency to progress to that area on the moon path receives nothing. A quick note. If a player advances twice on the moon path from crewed missions, they do not receive the bonus tile for the first space they moved over. Once a crew bonus tile is awarded, it is used immediately. Crew bonus tiles provide two sets of rewards. The front of the tile awards a hazard card and in veteran games an advancement token. The reverse side typically awards victory points or other rewards. Remember the extra crew bonus tiles we stack next to the game board during setup? There are also opportunities to win one of these, with certain worker actions. However, when these tiles are claimed, players only receive the award on the back side of the tile. They do not receive an advancement token or a hazard card. Finally, the last crew mission tile on the moon path awards 7 victory points and ends the game once the round is completed. And once the round ends, the player with more victory points wins the game. With the rules covered so far in this tutorial, players should be able to begin their own game using the beginner rules. Next, we're going to take a look at the veteran rules for the game. The veteran version of One Small Step adds advancement cards to gameplay. Each team may purchase any one of the four face-up advancement cards on the game board between any two phases. Teams purchase cards in initiative order and may purchase multiple cards. Once purchased from the main game board, advancement cards are placed to the left of the player's agency board and act as a permanent upgrade for the remainder of the game. Afterwards, draw new cards from the advancement deck to fill any vacancies on the game board. At the top of each advancement card is its purchase cost. Here you'll notice a new form of currency called advancement tokens. Advancement tokens are awarded by completing crew missions first and winning the crew bonus tile on the moon path and can be awarded by some card events. The middle section of the advancement card shows its effect and the bottom when that effect can be used. Now, let's look at the veteran Earth spaces with its upgrades. At the beginning of the game, all 10 satellite upgrades start covered by satellite markers, 
and all 10 crew upgrades start covered by crew markers. Either side of the markers can be face up, it doesn't matter. When the upgrades are covered, they have no effect on the worker action spaces they're connected to. Therefore, to get the upgrades, players need to uncover the spaces. To uncover an upgrade space, a player needs to successfully complete a mission with the Earth Upgrade Reward symbol. A successful satellite mission with this symbol removes a satellite marker of the player's choice. Place the satellite marker removed on the orbit line around the Earth with the nation's emblem face up. A successful crew mission with the symbol removes a crew marker of the player's choice. Place the crew marker on the moon path to mark progress for the mission completed. Each Earth upgrade space has additional symbols to resolve for the regular worker action. The corner of each space also has one of three modifiers. A plus symbol means the upgrade provides an additional effect to the worker action. A minus symbol reduces the cost of the worker action. And a slash mark indicates an alternative effect which means the player may use the upgrade's effects instead of the regular worker action. Some quick notes regarding upgrades. Upgrade actions are never affected by other upgrades. And upgrade costs are treated separately. For example, additional effect upgrades are still gained even if the normal worker action's cost is not paid. Also, if, if an upgrade has a cost, it must be paid in order to use the upgrade's effect. This cost is separate from any cost that must be paid for the worker action. The challenge for upgrades is once they're enabled, either side that places a worker on the connected worker space receives the upgrade. Therefore, players need to strategize which upgrades to unlock and how it affects their opponent as well as their own chances to win the game. And now that we've covered upgrades, you're ready to begin your own game of one small step using the veteran rules. Before we close out this episode, I'd like to recognize the Harsh Rules Patreon supporters that help make content like this possible. If you'd like to support the channel, head over to patreon.com slash harsh rules to learn more. And once again, thank you for your support. If you found this video helpful, please give me a like and share with your friends. To be the first notified when the next episode of Harsh Rules becomes available, please hit the bell icon for notifications. And as always, this has been Harsh for Harsh Rules. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next video.